Ukraine claims it has hit Russia's longest railway tunnel in the mountains, 3,000 miles inside Russian soil, cutting a key freight link between Russia and China. We're in Kharkiv again, and this is the scene of yet another Russian strike. My name is Jerome Starkey. I'm the defense editor at The Sun newspaper, and this is the latest roundup of the most important news from the war in Ukraine. We'll start with the strike on the Severomoysky railway tunnel. This, is, uh, this sits on a main Russian railway line that stretches about 2,700 miles from central Russia towards its east coast on the Sea of Japan. It runs roughly parallel, but about 500 miles to the north of the Trans-Siberian Railway, running east to west, central Russia to eastern Russia. And according to sources in Ukraine, it's been used as a key link for military material from China, indeed from eastern Russia, being brought westwards towards the front lines in Ukraine. There are reports that four explosions rocked the tunnel, paralyzing the line late on Wednesday night. It's not clear whether those explosions were carried into the tunnel on a train, but there was a train in the tunnel at the time, or whether the blasts had been played, the explosives had been placed there in advance. Nonetheless, Ukrainian security sources claiming that this was the work of their SBU intelligence service. Now, why does it matter? Well, of course, immediately it has blocked a key uh, arterial railway line. That is an inconvenience, a significant inconvenience for Russia. Russian media have reported that dedicated fire trains have raced to the scene. They said that nobody was hurt. It could be, it's likely be a matter of time before this railway line is reopened, but nonetheless, so it's a temporary inconvenience, but it's also, of course, a show of force, a show of the Ukraine's reach that if these reports are confirmed, that it's intelligence services, that saboteurs acting in ways that are reminiscent of the special operations executive that Winston Churchill sent into occupied France during World War II, that these saboteurs can operate so deep behind Russian lines. Now, that's really going to be a theme of this week's frontline update because instead of talking about what's happening on the battlefield in the trenches where Russian and Ukrainian soldiers are facing off against each other, we're going to focus more on what's happening behind the front lines because indeed over the last week or so that appears to be uh, where the most dramatic and dynamic changes are taking place. So, of course, this attack on the railway line comes just a few days after a huge explosion rocked a Russian tank factory in the Ural Mountains. Technically, a tractor factory, but we understand this plant had been manufacturing engines for T-72 and T-90 tanks. Again, the exact cause of that explosion not known. Uh, there haven't been formal claims of responsibility. Uh, Russia suggested it was an electrical fault, but nonetheless, uh, suspicion falling on Ukraine's intelligence services because they have launched a number of these strikes over the course of almost two years of war. We know that they've hit railway lines, uh, they've hit factories and they've hit airfields, all an attempt to degrade Russia's ability to wage war on the front lines. And of course, the third thing I want to talk about is just in the last 24 hours, we understand that Ukraine has managed to hack into Crimea's television broadcast. So this is in occupied Crimea, which has been held by Russia since 2014. People watching their televisions there last night would have seen an address uh, from President Zelensky, from his spy chief, Kirillo Budinov, who runs the military intelligence department, the GUR, and from General Zeluzhny, the commander of Ukraine's armed forces. Now, the, their message was that Crimea is Ukrainian and that they will repel Russian forces from Crimea. There were also, as part of this hack, some of the uh, televisions were seen displaying the message, Putin is a dickhead, Putin Julio uh, in Russian, a chant that has been uh, repeated and shouted at, at protests, anti-Russia protests, before the full-scale invasion uh, in February last year. Now, it hasn't all been one way. Uh, the appearance of Kirillo Budinov significant because actually uh, that came just days after it emerged that his wife, Mariana, appeared to have suffered poisoning, heavy metals poisoning, uh, while she was in Kyiv, thought to be part of a Russian plot to try and kill her, a num or possibly, uh, perhaps more likely, 
to kill him as well. We understand a number of senior members of the uh, GUR military intelligence service in Ukraine were also uh, affected by this poisoning. It's thought they ate arsenic and lead in contaminated food. But Mariana, being smaller of frame and stature, uh, was the one who noticed the symptoms first, indeed possibly felt the symptoms most seriously. Officials saying her life is out of danger, but she felt unwell. She was taken to hospital and is still receiving treatment. A number of other people also affected by that. So there we have it. The war being fought uh, in unconventional ways by saboteurs, uh, assassination attempts far behind the front line. I mean, of course, the soldiers are still fighting hard and soldiers are still dying on the front lines as the weather has changed in Ukraine in pretty horrific, icy and cold conditions. Down in Kherson in the south, we've seen Ukraine managing to move uh, further on the east bank, on the left bank of the Dnipro River around Kherson, where they've been making progress uh, in recent weeks. And of course, you now have Divka, which is the, in the eastern Ukraine, which is the focus of Russia's assault. Russian forces continue their pincer movement to try and surround Avdivka. That is becoming reminiscent in many ways of the battle for Bakhmut that we saw last year uh, and, and into the early months of this year as well. I saw an estimate recently suggesting that more than 70,000 Russian soldiers had been killed in the battle for Bakhmut. We've heard from Ukraine's commander, General Zaluzhny, who's saying that when Russian forces move in uh, Avdivka, when they try and attack it, they are killed in their thousands. And the message coming both from Zaluzhny and again from uh, Western officials, including uh, NATO officials, is that Russia is showing its appetite, its willingness to suffer extraordinary losses. And we are seeing that uh, play out in Avdivka. The question will be what Ukraine is prepared to lose in order to try and hold it, how much Ukraine, how many people Ukraine is prepared to lose in order to continue inflicting uh, these high losses on Russian forces. It's also worth noting that since uh, our last update, General Zaluzhny has got into a bit of a spat with President Zelensky over the state of the conflict. Uh, Zaluzhny has said it has reached a stalemate. He said his forces are unlikely to make a beautiful breakthrough, were his words. Uh, President Zelensky, uh, who we were lucky enough to interview last week, was adamant that that is not the case. He, he says that there is not uh, a stalemate. Uh, there's certainly not a stalemate of morale in his words because his soldiers are fighting on their country. They remain determined uh, to free it, he says, whereas Russian forces uh, are, are fighting for an ideal they don't really believe in, uh, occupying a, a foreign land. And he also points out that it's not a stalemate in the sky because uh, Russia still has significant superiority, significant advantages in the sky. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, for those of you who left them in the comments on YouTube, uh, one of the first ones was, can Ukraine repair the Antonovsky Bridge? Well, this, of course, is the bridge linking Kherson City across the Dnipro River. It's one of the only bridges for about 200 miles because, because both the Antonovsky Bridge and further upstream, the Novohakovka Dam, have both been destroyed by Russian forces. Now, I've been to the uh, Antonovsky Bridge, uh, which was regularly getting uh, shelled by Russian forces. That was after Russian forces had retreated. And from the bank uh, that was then in, well, from the right bank of the river, you can see that two sections of the bridge have been blown out. They've completely collapsed into the water. So, I mean, in theory, yes, of course it could be repaired. In practice, no, not at the moment, because it's within Russian artillery range, within Russian rocket range. So, you know, the level of engineering and work that would be required uh, to do that would just mean that the people involved uh, would likely get slaughtered. I and mean, of course, you could compare that to attacks, for example, on the Kerch Bridge that Ukraine has, has carried out, two attacks on the Kerch Bridge that link mainland Russia to occupied Crimea. Russia has been able to repair the Kerch Bridge, but that's because it's much further away from the front lines. Those successful attacks that Ukraine has managed to launch have been you know, audacious but unusual because they're so far away. And it's not like Ukraine can just line up its howitzers and pound the bridge every day uh, you know, to try and disrupt repair efforts. 
Uh, question number two was about industry and was about the UK versus European efforts to ramp up production of ammunition in order to keep Ukraine in the fight. It's a really good question because as we enter this second winter, likely to be a hard winter, I know that people in Ukraine are concerned about the efforts Russia is making to mobilise its war economy. Indeed, some estimates that Russia is planning to make upwards of 6,500 missiles in the coming calendar year. The short answer is Europe and the UK doing enough. It doesn't look like it at the moment. No. I mean, to give you an example, uh, in July, we saw the British government announce an extra £190 million with some fanfare to increase uh, heavy artillery shells. That was going to increase, that was going to lead to an eightfold increase in shells. But even the exact price of an artillery shell was uh, commercially sensitive. But if you assume that it's about £1,000 a shell, that would lead to 190,000 shells. Based on a kind of average consumption rate, Ukraine is going through about 6,000 a day on a quiet day. Uh, 190,000 shells would keep Ukraine in the fight for about a month. And having said all of that, this increase in production that the UK has announced isn't actually going to come into effect. The first shells aren't going to come off the production line, be available uh, until at least the end of next year. Uh, there was a question about the Russian General Templinsky. Has he been injured? Is he still in the fight? The short answer is I can't tell you. Uh, this is a general who was brought back in to command troops in Russian-held Kherson on the left bank. There have been reports he's been hurt. I can't confirm either way. We don't know. Uh, worth pointing out also, there are reports that a second general, uh, General Zavodsky, uh, has also been killed. Those reports have come from, the, uh, from a Russian higher staff and command college where he trained. The suggestion is that he uh, was killed by a landmine some distance behind the front lines, um, a landmine that had been laid by another Russian unit to protect its own positions. Now, depending on the estimates, that suggests anywhere between 12 and 16 Russian generals have been killed uh, during the course of the war. Uh, we're doing a few more questions today than usual. Uh, there's one about glide bombs. There was talk about uh, Ukraine receiving American glide bombs. Uh, that was back in February. We haven't heard anything for a long while. That's true. Uh, but actually, they do appear to be back on the agenda. Now, these are modified bombs uh, that were originally designed to be fired from aircraft, but appear to be modified, that are being modified for Ukraine, so they can be fired from land launchers towards land targets. They are known as uh, ground-launched small diameter bombs, GLSDBs. Um, there is some suggestion, it's not confirmed, uh, that they may be arriving very imminently. Uh, speculation because among the latest package of military aid for Ukraine was a new HIMARS launcher. Now, Ukraine has a number of these HIMARS uh, rocket launchers, including uh, UK variants that have been supplied, uh, both wheeled and tracked. Seems unusual that America should announce sending one more. Uh, suggestions that this one more might be a modified launcher that can that can fire these glide bombs. These glide bombs will have a range of about 90 miles, uh, could massively increase uh, Ukraine's artillery potential because these bombs are going to be relatively cheap. Hopefully they'll have, uh, potentially they'll have lots of them so they can use them, um, you know, they can use them more freely and they'll be mobile from these mobile launchers. Final question about F-16s. When, Ukraine, when is Ukraine going to get its F-16s? Are they going to fly with Bioreactor drones? Well, short answer, too early to tell. Uh, we understand that F-16 training is uh, continuing. It's continuing in Europe. Um, whether they're going to fly with Bioreactor drones? Well, actually, what's interesting is we haven't heard a lot about the Bioreactor drones since the beginning of the war. These are Turkish-made drones. They played a key role uh, in the conflict in Gorokorabakh uh, in Azerbaijan. But it appears, it would seem that technology has evolved so much over the course of the Ukraine conflict uh, that they're no longer cutting edge technology and which is, would suggest why they're not being used as much. So when the F-16s arrive, uh, Ukraine has shown uh, a willingness and an ability to innovate uh, with the technology it has at its disposal. We'll likely see them using those F-16s very carefully because they're incredibly sophisticated uh, and precious uh, and powerful piece uh, weapon. Um, but they haven't got them yet, so it's too early to tell exactly how they'll be used. Thank you for watching or listening. Please don't forget to ask your questions in the comments in YouTube. Uh, and if you're listening, please don't forget to follow or subscribe to The Frontline with Jerome Starkey wherever you get your podcasts for the latest news on Ukraine.